All right. Aloha, everyone. Welcome to a special presentation on Bill 21. We're all very excited that you're here. I'm Chase Martin, your MC. I'm the new Communications, Community Outreach, and Development Manager for Maui Nui Marine Resource Council. Bill 21 is a new piece of legislation that aims to prevent light pollution to better help endangered seabirds with added benefits to sea turtles, human health, astronomy, and cultural practices. The bill passed out of the Climate Action, Resilience, and Environment Committee on September 8th with unanimous support and now heads to the council meeting on September 20th tomorrow for first reading. A few things before you get going. You'll notice that your microphone is on mute. Please keep it on mute during the presentation to avoid distractions. We invite you to submit questions by using the Q&A button on the lower edge of your screen and we'll leave time at the end of the presentation to answer your questions. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our presenters. First, we have Jay Penniman. He earned his BS at Portland State University in 1977. He has worked as an independent contractor doing forestry, wildlife and vegetation surveys, management and assessment. At the Point Reyes Bird Observatory, he was employed as a biologist on Southeast Farallon Island, which is about 26 miles west of San Francisco. There, he was a member of the team of biologists who ran the remote research station monitoring 13 breeding bird species and four marine mammal species. He also performed at sea surveys for seabirds and marine mammals in the near and offshore waters of the Northwest coast of North America. And since 2006, he has worked for the Pacific Cooperative Studies Unit of the University of Hawaii managing the Maui Nui Seabird Recovery Project. Next, we'll have Cheryl King, MSC, who is a Maui-based marine biologist whose education, fieldwork, and travels has, have significantly enriched her experiences and have inspired her love of being surrounded by nature in remote, wild places. Cheryl has specialized in Hawaiian endangered species research, rescue, and management for 22 years. Under the Hawaii Association for Marine Education and Research, also called HAMMER, she runs the statewide photo ID catalog for Hawaiian hawksbill sea turtles and her shark statistics, marine debris research and cleanup projects. She also works part-time for the Maui Nui, Maui Nui Seabird Recovery Project and the Sustainable Tourism Association of Hawaii. With Ocean Associates, she provides emergency support for NOAA Fisheries Marine Mental Health and Stranding Rescue Program and volunteers for NOAA's Large Whale Entanglement Response Network. Cheryl has been saving sea turtles since 1996, so I'll be sharing her light, lighting related knowledge, data and experiences with us today. And last but certainly not least, we have Maui Council, Maui Council, Council member Tele, Kelly Takaya King. She holds the council seat for the South Maui residency area. She is the chair of the Climate Action, Resilience and Environment Committee. Council member King has devoted her time in office to actively find solutions for affordable housing, environmental protection and climate change and diversifying our economy. Her solutions-oriented approach to her work can be seen in her numerous accomplishments, including legislations for a wetlands overlay district and updated outdoor lighting regulations, which recently passed from the CARE Committee. And I'll turn it over to Jay to get us started. Thank you, Chase. Let's see if we can get this sharing to work now. There we go. Is that everybody see the slide that's number one there? Yep, looking good. Very good. Aloha. Maui Nui Seabird Recovery Project is a project of the Pacific Cooperative Studies Unit of the University of Hawaii at Manoa. We work in close cooperation with the Department of Land and Natural Resources, Division of Forestry and Wildlife. Our mission is to locate, protect, and enhance seabird populations in Maui Nui. The Maui News printed a notice of this presentation that a bit misrepresented my and my project's involvement with Bill 21. We have not participated in the drafting of this bill for an ordinance. We and others have provided the Council's Care Committee with information from our research and understandings of the research of others that inform the decisions of Council Member King's staff in drafting this bill for an ordinance. I manage this project and I do want to acknowledge before we go on the rest of my staff members who are out there every day working to protect and monitor our seabird populations and their habitats. 
Jenny Learned is our operations GIS specialist. Martin Fry leads the field crew. Emily Severson is our outreach liaison. Sky Anderson, Cheryl King, and Mariah Rivera are field associates. Joshua DeCambra is our Kupu AmeriCorps service member. And Mark Fisher works intermittently recovering fallout birds on the west side. In addition, we have a core of volunteers of which Mike Ng deserves special recognition for his daily care of the Uwa'ukani colony at Kamaole Beach Park 3. This is the now endangered Uwa'u, known in English as the Hawaiian petrel. Before humans arrived in Hawaii, Uwa'u were the most numerous animals in the archipelago. They nested from the shorelines to the mountaintops. <laughs> They attend their nesting sites only during the breeding season, February through November, and arrive each day just after sunset, departing just before sunrise the next day. During their arrivals and departures, there were so many of them, they would have obscured the sky. With the arrival of Polynesians who became the Hawaiians, the seabirds' dominance began to decline. Human alteration of the habitat for domiciles and agriculture forever changed the Aina reducing available seabird habitat. This trend dramatically accelerated with the arrival of Europeans and Haoles from around the world. This paper on the slide is an interview and interpretation of the subfossil record from which Ms. Moniz documents the decline of seabirds where people came to inhabit islands throughout the Pacific. The only mammals present in pre-Hawaiian human contact Hawaii were the Opeapea, the Hawaiian hoary bat, and the Ilio Holo Ika Ua Ua, the Hawaiian monk seal. The Polynesians introduced one species of rat and small pigs to Hawaii. Europeans added boars, two species of rat, cats, and mongoose. These mammalian predators decimated seabird and forest bird populations and continue to kill our remaining native birds. On the island of Kauai, Radar data has indicated a 78% decline overall in numbers of Hawaiian petrels and a 94% decline in numbers of Newell shearwaters over the past years 1993 to 2013. Much of this decline can be attributed to light distraction and infrastructure collisions resulting in mortality, largely of fledglings, leaving their native burrows for the first time on their way out to sea. Seabirds play important ecological and cultural roles. Polynesian voyagers have a toolkit for navigating the seas, and seabirds significantly contribute to their ability to wayfind on the open seas. The voyagers are aware of seabird behavior and the habitats that different species inhabit. They use this knowledge in combination with their extensive knowledge of celestial navigation, ocean habitats, and much more to skillfully traverse the world's seas. Polynesian voyagers and fishing people around the world use feeding flocks of seabirds to identify where large predator fish are feeding and available to be caught. Large predator fish such as ahi and aku push bait fish up near the surface where seabirds gather to feed upon them from above, while the fish we like to eat are feeding from below. This is a map of the Inca Empire in gray with the geographical distribution of guano birds in black delineated line and the principal guano deposits, the black dots, along the western coast of South America. The prosperity of the Inca civilization was due to an economic system based not only on agricultural production, but also on the organization of an integrated system to support food supply by encompassing access to guano sources, its transportation across the empire and the protection of guano birds and their natural habitats. The dependence on guano to fertilize the vast and arid land across the empire turned the guano birds into one of the most important pillars of Inca development and expansion. To achieve sustainable use of a natural resource such as seabird guano, which was of major economic impact importance for the development of the Inca empire, management plans based on a penal code aimed aiming to preserve these species and their natural habitats gradually emerged and could be among or indeed represent the first habitat conservation measures ever implemented by humans. 
These conservation measures allowed not only the sustainable use of seabird guano as a resource, but also the guano bird species to thrive due to protection and habitat conservation. The efficacy of the management plan developed by the Incas is especially evident when compared with and contrasted with the overexploitation of Peruvian guano during the 19th century, which led to the huge decline of these seabird populations. Guano was harvested from islands and atolls in Papahanaumokuakea and transported to the North American continent for many years, and the same lack of conservation awareness took place as on the coast of Chile, resulted in massive declines in seabird colonies. As shown in this study and other recent papers, seabirds provide important nutrient subsidies to the coast where seabird colonies and roosting sites are adjacent to coral reefs. Given that nearly one third of the seabird species are at risk of its extinction globally, conservation needs to consider possible effects of declines in this nutrient subsidy on coral growth everywhere around pristine remote atolls and populated higher islands. As we devise strategies to build coastal resilience, we need to do everything we can to enhance coral reef ecosystem health. The reefs are the island's first line of defense against the erosive effects of ocean waves and seabird nutrients will strengthen the ability of the reef's ecosystem to maintain health. Before human occupation of the islands, seabirds occupied the Aina, Mauka to Makai. Our native forests, the realm of Wawakua, thrive in soils supplied with marine derived nutrients by seabirds. The capacity of our forests to capture rain and move it into our aquifers depend upon the maintenance of alien weed control species, weed species control, thank you, mist guys, and maximizing native ground covers and canopy trees. Seabirds have a vital role in optimizing this relationship. For me, seabirds are examples of the wonderful diversity of life on planet Earth. They provide ecosystem services in Hawaii and throughout the world. Our soils in which the unique native plant community evolved are a product of seabird marine derived nutrients, organic matter in the form of guano, mixed with mineral lava soils. They are uniquely <clears throat> adapted to life over the ocean. They know and respect the moods of Kanaloa. In 1912, W.E. Clark documented detrimental impacts of lighthouses on migrating birds. Changing navigational lights to rotating beams helped reduce impacts, but many other light sources continue to attract and harm birds. Birds evolved complex complementary systems for orientation and vision long before humans developed artificial light. We still have much to learn, but recent science has begun to clarify how artificial light poses a threat to birds, especially nocturnal migrants. In the 1960s, it was discovered that migrating birds possess the ability to orient themselves using cues from the sun, polarized light, stars, the Earth's magnetic field, visual landmarks, and possibly even odors. Exactly how this works, and certainly varies among species, is still being investigated. The Earth's magnetic field can provide both directional and positional information. It appears that night flying migrants, and perhaps all bird species, have magnetic field detecting structures in the retina of the eye that depend on light for function and provide compass orientation. This magnetic sense is wavelength dependent. Artificial night lighting disrupts the orientation mechanisms which evolve to work with dimmer natural night light sources and can cause birds to deviate from their flight paths. This deviation is variable in degree and may be species specific. As night migrating birds approach light sources, they become disoriented and eventually land, often crash land, in the built environment. I must note here that the Maui County Parks Department did work with us to redirect and shield the lights at Kalama Park, and they are not nearly this bright anymore. These lights are a good example of where there are not yet lights with low blue content available for sports complexes. So down directing, shielding, and turning lights off when no one is using them must be practiced to min ma minimize negative impacts on wildlife and the night ecosystem. 
we do have ample documentation that seabirds worldwide are the victims of uncontrolled nighttime lighting. It is clear that petrels, shearwaters, and storm petrels are impacted. It is interesting that there are no good records of albatross misoriented by light. There are demonstrated population level impacts, high proportion of fledglings impacted and additional mortality. In 1975, MJ Imber noted the tendency for fledglings just leaving the breeding colony to be attracted to nearby artificial lights. In studies of several species of oceanic birds, he found 80 to 100% of their prey are bioluminescent and that many oceanic petrels are instinctively attracted to light sources because they detect their prey by them. Once young birds began taking such prey, they would no longer be fooled by artificial sources of light. Initially, however, a proportion of fledglings are distracted toward artificial light, perhaps because of stronger instincts that have not yet been given direction. One of the main foods of Uwa'u are mctophids, and you can see from this photo that they are bioluminescent and their lantern color is short wavelength or blue light. There are more than 40 species documented found attracted to artificial life sources. Be those street lights, ocean going vessels with ice searching spotlights in the Antarctic, hotels and resorts, <clears throat> resort areas, sports complexes with night activities, agricultural operations harvesting under lights at night, or any one of the human activities for which we attempt to push back the darkness. Three studies. Witherington and Martin in 2000, Rich and Longcore in 2006, and Frank in 1998, all performed studies showing light with spikes in the short wavelength end of the spectrum, violet, blue, and teal, are the most disruptive to nocturnal wildlife, turtles, fish, and insects. Long wavelength light, yellow, amber, and red appear to be the least disruptive. National Park Service guidelines have chosen to adopt yellow or amber as recommended whenever possible. This is consistent with the needs for astronomy because shorter wavelength light scatters in the atmosphere, obscuring the dark night sky. Selecting narrow spectrum light of the minimal intensity required for lighting needs is a good choice. Rayleigh scattering is far greater with short wavelength light as shown in this graph. This scattering happens when light interacts with particles in the air, reflects off surfaces and the ground. The amount of moisture in our island atmosphere exacerbates the scattering further, reducing nighttime visibility of the stars and other objects. Maui is home to the Near Earth Objects, that's NEO, observatory. On Haleakala, astronomers peer into the night sky searching for objects that could be on trajectories that would result in collision with planet Earth, such as the collision that wiped out the dinosaurs. The Rayleigh scattering from our lights in Wailuku and Kahului currently greatly reduce visibility in the Northwest Quadrant, increasing the short wavelength content of our street lights, as the Public Works Department wants to do, will further reduce visibility for NEO observations. Rayleigh scattering may also impact wildlife, including seabirds, as I noted earlier. Night flying migrants and perhaps all bird species have magnetic field detecting structures in the retina of the eye that depend on light for function and provide compass orientation. This magnetic sense is wavelength dependent. In order to minimize the scattering, we need to use long wavelength light at night. I'll now go through three studies that lend credence to the idea that short wavelength light is distracting to seabirds and that by limiting it, as Hawaii Island has done, will reduce fallout and benefit the whole night ecosystem. In this study of short-tailed shearwater distraction by lights, three light types, metal halide, LED, and high-pressure sodium were tested during fledging season. The table provided in the paper does not give percent short wavelength content, rather uses Kelvin. And as you can see, the HPS is 2000, metal halide 4500, and LED 4536. Kelvin, or color cor correlated temperature, does not necessarily relate directly to the amount of blue content in a light. However, as a generalization, the lower the Kelvin value, the lower the short wave content. 
From the same paper, this graph does show the relative intensity of the spectral content, and it is clear that both LED and metal halide have significantly more wavelength content in the shorter, that is 500 nanometers is right here. <coughs> <clears throat> That's the blue end of the spectrum. HPS has the least amount of blue content, and it distracted the fewest short-tailed shearwaters. HPS, as used on Hawaii, on Maui, has 8% spectral content, less than 500 na nanometers, still enough to draw in some fledglings that have not learned to discriminate the blue of artificial lights from their bioluminescent prey. The nonprofit Oikonos has been working with local community on Robinson Crusoe Island off Chile to protect and rebuild the endangered pink-footed shearwater colony there. The island's lights are high pressure sodium and fledglings and some adults are regularly grounded and killed by cats and car collisions. New lights were installed along the shoreline in 2019 and seabird fallout increased threefold. Oikonos staff worked to get low blue content filters installed and greatly reduce the fallout by the lights. Chile has now adopted this standard county, countrywide in wildlife sensitive areas. All of Maui is wildlife sensitive area. This is the spectral content of the unfiltered high pressure sodium lights. The spike in the short wavelength content is what the filters eliminate. With the filters applied, there is no spike in the short wavelength content. The filters are a short-term solution while the local staff and city officials work with lighting manufacturers to select the appropriate LED lights with 1% content between 300 and 779 nanometers and 1% content between 380 and 499 nanometers. This graph shows the impact of the year of unfiltered HPS. Fallout birds increased from less than 50 in most years to over 150. With the addition of the filters, numbers returned to previous levels. Through our Save Our Seabirds program, we recover fallout fledglings each fall. When some high pressure sodium lights on Maui were replaced with LEDs having higher blue content, the number of fallout birds associated with them increased. We looked at the fallout data from the areas where new street lights have been installed before and after the new lights went in, and these are the results. You may hear this paper cited as evidence that changing street lights on Windward Oahu from high pressure sodium to three to 4,000 Kelvin LED did not change the number of fallout Oahukani collected dead on the road. The high pressure sodium lights have a blue content of 8%, and the LEDs have at least 12% blue light content. Both are significantly higher than our recommendation of less than 2%. The study did not consider the lights present on Windward Oahu in addition to the street lights. Finding locations where a single type of light is present is a real problem when trying to study differences in distraction potential of light types. Along the stretch of highway study, there are numerous other larger and brighter lights at various facilities and businesses. In my personal observations of seabird behavior, when distracted and disoriented by lights, I have witnessed them flying at top speed round and round, climbing high above the light, dropping back down at various angles, and often crashing at some distance far from the distracting light. So making assumptions of what light caused distraction from birds found dead on the road is speculation at best. The authors <coughs> conclude their paper with this statement, a recent survey of lighting experts suggests that while LEDs can be adjusted to reduce light pollution and minimize wildlife impacts, yet municipalities rarely capitalize on these benefits. For instance, although new technology LED streetlights can filter out lower wavelengths, full spectrum white LED lights maximize brightness and are commonly chosen to replace HPS streetlights. Furthermore, LEDs come in a variety of CCTs with options as low as 2200 Kelvin and the maximum temperature experts recommend for wildlife. <coughs> Even though the perception of light by different groups of wildlife species is not fully described and taxonomic specific metrics to both radiance and irradiance are needed, nevertheless, a no regards approach 
can be taken to guide the choose choice of spectrum that LEDs make possible, which is to reduce blue content. With amber and filtered products on the market, low color temperature, less than or equal to 2200 Kelvin are feasible and desirable to minimize adverse impacts. A no regards regrets approach is also referred to as a precautionary principle. When there is ample evidence of an effect, in this case, the negative effects of short wavelength light at night on human health, astronomy, turtles, coral reefs, et cetera, it is best to take an ecosystem approach and in this case, eliminate as much short wavelength light from our night environment as possible. Seabird fallout all over the island of Maui where there are lights. We do not really know the extent of fallout because we cannot do system, systematic surveys of all areas due to our limited resources. We have created Save Our Seabirds with Hawaiian Electric and six other businesses and agencies. With their support, we do outreach to raise the level of awareness of the problem of seabird fallout. We depend on aware citizens and businesses to alert us when they see a downed seabird. We educate people on how to safely collect downed birds, place them in a ventilated box with a towel in the bottom, no food or water, and call us at our hotline number, 808-573-BIRD. Most birds we get as fallout can be released after we assess their condition. We place a band on one leg so we can identify them with the, when they return in five to six years to breed. We have recorded several birds that have been were fallout fledglings and they return to breed. Without community helping us to recover these birds, they would likely die. Because at this time, we do not have a seabird rehabilitation center on Maui. When we get injured birds requiring rehabilitation, we send them to Hawaii Wildlife Center on Hawaii Island. This chart shows the annual Maui fallout. Notice how high the fallout was in 2012. There are a number of factors that influence fallout rates with the phase of moon being highly significant. When the moon is new and the sky is dark, our lights have a bigger impact, causing more birds to fall out. 2012 was such a year. The black line indicates the new moon at the bottom and the full moon at the top. The Oahu fledging season peaked in the new moon phase. We also had low clouds and Kona winds. Uau Kani fledged in the month following Uau with a bit of overlap. Again, you can see the graph that the darkest time of the moon had the highest fallout. Unfortunately, for 2022, our prediction is that fallout for both Uau and Uau Kani will coincide with a new moon. To help reduce seabird fallout will be especially important to turn off unnecessary lights, dim lights as much as possible, and close blinds to keep light from inside from trespassing on the night darkness. Where do we go from here and what can we do aside from recommending additional research? There are a number of first steps which can be taken by anyone concerned with protecting seabirds from light misorientation and distraction, turtles from nesting failure and nest departure confusion, and dark skies from unnecessary light pollution. The National Park Service, Natural Sounds and Night Skies Division, and the Florida Fish and Wildlife have very clear standards, and Hawaii Island's outdoor lighting standards fall well within these. Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission recommendations are congruent with National Park Service. The first two guidelines remain critically important. LED lighting is now replacing most legacy lighting due to real energy savings and the ability to control color temperature and intensity. LEDs must be kept low in spectral blue, that is less than 3000 Kelvin, ideally near to 2000 Kelvin to satisfy National Park and Florida Fish and Wildlife guidelines. These guidelines are being reevaluated, and we expect that, as Hawaii Island has done, CCT or Kelvin values will be replaced with the specifics for blue light content. Quoting from the ordinance, all outdoor lighting fixtures, except for neon, must limit short wavelength content to no more than 2% of blue light content. Blue light content means the ratio of the amount of energy emitted by the outdoor light fixture between 400 and 500 nanometers, divided by the amount of energy between 400 and 700 nanometers. Directing light to where it is needed is the first step 
in responsible lighting decision making. Reed, Sincock, and Heilman in 1985, working at the Kauai Surf Resort in Lihui, demonstrated a nearly 40% reduction in seabird fallout just by shielding of upward radiating light. Appropriate shielding will direct light where it is needed and prevent light trespass. For lighting anywhere near the coastline, light should be oriented so they do not shine over or toward the water. Birds and turtles looking from the water will see up into fixtures and even with shields, unless the shielding prevents the light from being visible from below. Mahalo for your attention. I now pass the screen and microphone to Cheryl King for her presentation about sea turtles and light impacts. Okay, hopefully everybody can hear me now. This is, my name is Cheryl. Um, thanks Jay for that awesome presentation. That's pretty much covers everything so well and really relatable to sea turtles. So we're gonna dive in a little bit more to the turtle land here. Um, real quick, I've been really fortunate to work with C my new Seabird Recovery Project and some awesome sea turtle organizations here on Maui and in Hawaii. And I have so many field experiences that I'd love to share related to lighting impacts, but only a bit of time for a few highlights. So let's get started. So many people around the world appreciate and often really love sea turtles for various reasons. And many would agree that they seem to have a certain wisdom about them. And Knowing the sea turtles that we really appreciate, um, they're not also known as the smartest creatures on the planet. They are reptiles and have relatively small sized brains, so their capacity is limited. Therefore, they completely rely on instincts. And if you've ever gotten a really cool look at a sea turtle eye before, this is a really interesting image. Um, they have eyes somewhat similar to ours, but our perceptions differ. They're really well adapted to living their lives at sea. And we aren't. <laughs> um, just some quick science here. Jay kind of went over all this too. Um, on the electromagnetic energy spectrum, visible light is composed of colors ranging from violet short wavelength to red longer wavelength. And there's been a lot of fascinating research, just like on seabirds, um, uh, sea turtles, mostly on the east coast of the mainland, to assess what types of light that sea turtles are attracted to. So overall, it's thought that the warmer colors are sea turtle friendly, meaning they don't tend to attract them, which is important to know when managing lighting on and near sea turtle beaches. Of course, it's often more complicated, but your lighting goal should be picking something that's greater than 560 nanometers in that reddish spectrum. And knowing hatchling sea turtles, how they take in information has also been studied. So if you've, if you've ever thought about how a hatchling turtle finds the ocean, it's, it's kind of complicated, but it's actually very similar. But if you think about how small sea turtles are and where they're looking um, and how much our bright world would probably cause them a lot of sensory overload, it's really unfortunate the way they have to deal with all of our issues. So multiple factual multiple factors are at play to help them find the ocean, but it's mostly purely a visual process. So they don't assess the beach slope, they don't use smell, they don't use sound. Um, none of those factors affect their movement towards the ocean or away from it. It's all a visual thing. So under natural conditions, hatchlings crawl towards the brighter open horizon, which should be the ocean, 
and away from tall, dark silhouettes like dunes and vegetation. So it's the using those two cues, away from tall, dark silhouettes towards the brighter open horizon, that's how they find the ocean. And this also works during the day too. These same cues are in play. But most of the sea turtles don't come out in the ocean and during the day because that's a little bit less safe for them for multiple reasons. So mostly they're coming out at night. So unfortunately, when there are artificial lights along the coast or inland, which causes a sky glow, this causes confusion for the hatchlings. So this is called disorientation. So they often crawl in circles trying to figure it out which way to go. So that's called disorientation. Misorientation is when they actually crawl the wrong way, where they can often succumb to predators, get lost in vegetation, and get run over on the road and die of dehydration. So that lag trap is really something that's a big issue. Even if you're not on the coast, the lights inland could be causing an issue. I'll show some examples of that too. And like say Jake said, Jay said with the seabirds, hatchlings are also more susceptible to lighting disorientations and misorientations during new moons since the fuller moon phases help drown out the impacts of lighting. And also thick clouds and rain showers also affect the sky's brightness, often causing even more confusion. And this is also true for seabirds. When I was working on uh, Palmyra Atoll, you would have to immediately put the blinds closed and turn off all the lights when it started raining because the red-footed boobies would start flying into the windows and crashing into our campsites because of the, even a little bit of light would attract them when it would rain. So it's true for birds too. So this is a really well researched subject and fatal problem for sea trolls all around the world, but there are so many multiple resources to, available to learn from. There's just, just Google it and you'll, you'll find so many tech reports and examples and, you know, writing, wrote, writing manuals and just good practices to help save your turtles around you. Um, so basically it's the same as what Jay just described, turning off the lights is best, but if you can't do that, you keep it long, keep it low and keep it unshielded or shielded like he, Jay said. Um, there are so many different types of actually known sea turtle friendly lighting options that they're marketed that way. So not only does managing lighting help sea turtles and seabirds, dark skies are also good for astronomy, save electricity, and help you sleep better. And the same source that Jay actually used, Florida guys are really on top of all this stuff. So this is a really good resource if you're interested in learning more. And Florida is a mecca for sea turtles and humans. So a lot of management has to occur there to help nature. So I went to grad school down in Broward County in Florida, Dania Beach, where the lighting impacts the sea turtles were very prevalent. So it's not that way anymore, but all the nests had to be moved to hatcheries. It was then discovered that the offshore predators would congregate in these areas as the turtles would come out. So they would pick them off really easily. So once the hatchlings emerged, we'd have to drive them to other darker locations but often it took so long for them to make it to the ocean still because of the lights. It was really sad to watch. We just have to watch, wait for hours for them to crawl the right way. And sometimes they would even come out of the ocean because of the lights. And once they're in the ocean, they should be switching to a different sense to find their offshore habitats. And the lighting was even overriding that. So it's pretty crazy. And adults would often end up in pools because of the lighting. We haven't had that happen on Maui yet, so thank you. Thank goodness, knock on wood. So in South Carolina, where I worked every summer throughout undergrad and for the 2016 nesting season, we had hundreds of nests to try to protect. And lighting was a huge problem, even with an ordinance. So we tried, we basically had to con constantly enforce it. So don't have time to get into this data right now, but we had we documented all the lighting misorientations and disorientations. And if you just check out this photo, you can see all these tiny lines going inland. Those are all individual hatchling tracks. So this one nest, all the hatchlings went the wrong way because of some lights. And even if we had a sand dune fence, that didn't block the lights enough either. So they all often went the wrong way. So these types of shade cloths would be, at least give them a chance at correctly orienting the right way but that didn't always work for very long as they would get a full look beyond the cloth. 
So luckily the island just adopted an improved lighting ordinance. So this should be helping significantly in the future. So as far as Hawaii goes, we have greens, the Honu and the hawksbills, the Honu Ea, who are critically endangered that nest in Hawaii. We also have some um, occasional olive ridleys as well. So sea turtles are known to return to the area where they're born, not necessarily the exact beach. And that can definitely change due to habitat conditions and habitat loss. So the majority of the greens nest in the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands, mainly at Lalo, French Frigate Shoals, which is not in France. Um, with such a low human population, the field station is still very conscious of any lights that might cause any hatchlings to stray. So there are nests everywhere up there. It's an amazing spot for them. Hatchlings everywhere. Mostly they get going to the right way, um, but sometimes the nests are laid a little bit inland, so there isn't much of a tall, dark silhouette since there are such low lying islands and the large vegetation is lacking. So often, not often, but sometimes, if they end up on the runway, which is right between the different sides of the island, they often crawl for hours. So it was our job to walk the runway each morning to see if we could get the turtles back to the ocean safely before they got dehydrated and worn out or eaten by crabs. Most of them made it, so that's good. Um, so back in the main Hawaiian Islands, there used to be a better balance with our environment. And now there's so much development everywhere. There's not those nice beaches that we want them to nest on. So we want to find, Turtle wants to find a quiet beach that's safe, accessible to dunes or the high tide line with native vegetation. Ideally, the quality of sand differs a lot between each beach. As we all know, all of our beaches are different. But the most important thing is overall the dark sky around the beach. So this is just a beautiful country looking down at our beaches in South Maui and going around the Lahaina side. And there's just a lot of light up there. Jay had some really good photos too. And unfortunately we've had, not lately, but 1993 and 1996, um, we had some adult turtles, hawksbill turtles killed on North Kia Road because they tried to go um, they went the wrong way, got run over on the road, which is super heartbreaking. Luckily, the turtle fence is up now, hopefully, mostly intact, and it's really important to keep that way. So it's crucial that we know where the nests are so we can protect, protect these turtles. Um, we had an incident in 1990, or 2009 where we didn't know there was a nest along Sugar Beach and the hatchlings came out and got crushed on the road. So we lost a whole, almost a whole nest there. It was really horrible. Um, the same thing happened in front of the Maui Lu, which is the new resort is now. Um, so these are nests that we didn't know about. And so if we don't know where they are, we can't protect them. So at this point, we have to do some major management around each nest to shade these hatchlings view of the lights around. So this is not the most natural thing. It's not ideal. So ideally, we'd get those lights turned out, but we've noticed that the hatchlings just go the wrong way. It could be one light. Oh yeah, we definitely need volunteers. So please contact Hawaii Wildlife Fund if you're interested. So it could be one light. Um, this happened, um, a hatchling actually came out of the water and went walked up towards the Lipoa Street. After it went, we thought it went to the ocean safely and it actually emerged and walked back up outside of the dune. So that was scary. And then a real quick example this year, and I'm running out of time, but um, this year, hatchlings were found dehydrated and deceased um, Malka of Kealia in an area far away from the road and from development. So there were no immediate lights that we could have, you know, blamed this on, so to speak. But if you look in that area, you've got the power plant in the distance and you've got Kahului um, creating again what the sky glow is called, um, really detrimental to these guys. We did find three live hatchlings, so that's good. Um, so just the next time you're driving down South Beach Road or anywhere along the coast, just take a closer look at the myriad of lights to see what our native wildlife has to decipher. And it's a very dangerous place. So this is a down bird that got run over, one of our seabirds, really sad. Um, they get crushed on the road. And like Jay mentioned, Queeks call 573 bird, even if it's dead or alive, regardless whether we're worried about the birds. And just some 
quick uh, fun ways to remember that lights out, sea turtles dig the dark, and after nine is turtle time. There's been all kinds of really wonderful educational outreach things in the world that we could use as well, but ideally we wouldn't have to because we would all turn out our lights and help the turtles and coexist with our native wildlife. And so hopefully we can pass this bill getting started tomorrow. Hopefully we can make it and testify and uh, help our wildlife. And that's all I have. Thank you so much for listening. Kelly, take it away. Oh, that was awesome. I'm gonna see if I can get my screen on here. Okay, let's see. Am I sharing yet here? Yep, you're good. Okay, am I on this? Uh, tell me if I'm on the full screen. Mm, yeah, you're on the presenter view at the moment, but. Okay, I've, uh, I'm not sure why it won't. Uh... <laughs> I had this earlier. Um, let me see, let me try the swap displays there. There you go, that's it. That it? Is that, okay. All right. Well, thank you so much. I, I almost feel like there should have been a, a violence disclaimer on those pictures, Cheryl. Um, that was just so sad to see uh, pictures of those hatchlings run over. Um, and also, I want to say before I get started that um, I'd like to sign up as a volunteer, you know, when I get more time with, after my term ends, because this is one thing that I really wanted to do for a long time. Um, and my, my presentation is really short. I just wanted to, I was asked to follow up with some information about the bill. This is sort of a, a short um, synopsis of what Bill 21 does. And I, and I um, even though they weren't involved in writing the bill, Jay Penniman and David Hankin of Earth Justice were both critical resource people for um, the content of this bill and for the science of this bill, as well as um, the, the state of Florida and the information we got from their programs over there. So basically what Bill 21 does is it protects our dark skies, it limits the light pollution, uh, outdoor lighting fixtures, and um, there are some exceptions, um, except for neon, the lights have to be limited to no more than 2% blue light content. They have to be directed down and fully shielded. And you'll see if you drive along the highway right now, you'll see some partially shielded, uh, especially on Veterans Highway lights. And then you'll see them on the, on the road as well. And a lot of our neighborhood lights are partially shielded, but this would require fully shielded outdoor lights. Mount, and then the, the lights on the outsides of buildings would have to be mounted low to the ground according to height restrictions that would be established by the Director of Public Works. And then um, legally installed outdoor lighting fixtures are exempt except for three years from the enactment of this ordinance, which is um, set to go into, into enactment of, of January of 2023. So then they would, um, we have three years to come into compliance. And the reason why legally installed outdoor lighting is there because we have a current lighting um, ordinance right now where we, if you see those outdoor lights, uh, especially the string lights that are unshielded, that are the bare bulbs, those are actually illegal. And so I think a lot of um, a lot of folks are going to be made aware of what's happening now that's not legal, that has to be fixed now. And then um, once you, if you have legal outdoor lights that don't quite fit the parameters of Bill 21, you have three years to come into compliance. So this bill will not affect any um, current construction projects because they'll have three years. Um, and so anything that's been approved already will not be affected, especially affordable housing. And, uh, and then the Director of Public Works will establish and maintain a list of compliant light fixtures. Currently, we've been, we've been reviewing the Florida list and there's hundreds of compliant light fixtures out there right now. So it should not be difficult. And most of them are not more expensive than the current lighting that we have now although they will save money in the long run and they last longer and they're more energy efficient. So uh, we've gotten reports from the, um, the Florida lighting bill that uh, folks have actually been saving money on their utility bill. The important um, exemptions, and you know, we had, we had a lot of folks come forward who were worried about some of their activities. And so we made exemptions for holiday lighting, for temporary lighting with cultural festivals and uh, fully shielded, um, String lights will be allowed. We um, we have exempted non-oceanfront residential lighting up to 8,100 lumens per acre. 
we have exempted lighting for permitted special events and sporting events on school properties, on nonprofit pop properties in county parks and facilities. So that means all we're not we're not endangering and we never have um, endangered outdoor sports at night. That was a fallacy that was misreported by the news. Um, the lighting for permitted special events on private properties would be exempted except for hotels and other transit accommodations, but not for private property in the sea level rise exposure area during May through December. May through December it was uh, were the uh, months given to us by uh, the turtle programs. And, but it also encompasses the seabird fallout months because that's September through December. The emergency lighting, uh, emergency services lighting will be exempt. And that's uh, that was requested by the police department and the fire department. Although I think eventually they're gonna find that there are compli compliant lightings that meet their industry standards. So hopefully in the future, they'll be looking at um, compliant lighting as well. And then of course the grace period uh, so I wanted to give folks um, just this final slide on how to testify to the Maui County Council that since this is coming up tomorrow in committee in uh, the full council for first reading, and you know you can send a written testimony, you can join online at this um, this link here, or you can call the number and testify by phone. Uh, you can call, you can show up in person at the uh, county chambers at Kalana O Maui Building on, at 200 South High Street or you can go to a district office near you. So if you live in South Maui, for instance, our South Maui district office is in the MEDB complex right next to Maui Brewery. Um, you can also send in written testimony or you can um, join the meeting start time at 9 a.m. on September. Well, that was an old, uh, 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 that was an old request. Right now we're doing um, testimony before the actual um, the actual category. So we're looking for category J on the agenda. And, and you know, sounds it sounds like it's going to take a while, but actually the first few items are housekeeping and ceremonial res resolutions and, um, you know, just things like um, county communications that will be automatically referred. So um, I, I'd also, I also wanted to, um, let me see if I can stop screen share. And I, I wanted to thank um, all the folks, the, um, Maui Nui Marine Resource Council, of course, for putting this on. Um, there we go. Uh, Maui Nui Seabird Recovery Program, Hawaii Wildlife Fund, the um, and and the utility. I mean, this was not planned and it was not organized. But the day before I um, I brought this to the final council meeting where it passed out unanimously, this flyer was in my utility bill. And it's called SOS Save Our Seabirds, and it has all these organizations. So um, the, the the utility Hiko is fairly aware of these issues, and they've been working with the Maui Nui Seabird Recovery Program. They've been working with the county, actually. They've been working with the National Park Service and um, Hawaii Wildlife Fund to make people aware through the this kinds of these kinds of um, advertisements. So that, that education piece has already started and it's been ongoing. And what we're doing is we're taking our current uh, lighting or, uh, ordinance, which was a good ordinance seven years ago when it originally passed and it needs updating with what we now know about the different lighting types and about the blue wavelength light versus the uh, red and amber and yellow wavelength lights. So I'll stop there and hopefully we have time for a few questions, but thank you so much for putting this presentation on. Chase and Meredith. Yeah, of course. Thank you so much for everyone for presenting on this important legislation. We're very excited to see what happens next. <laughs> um, we do have time for Q&A. So if you have a question, you can drop it into the Q&A feature on the lower part of your screen. Um, there are three questions that have come in. Um, I think the first two, oh, we got one answered. Um, Cheryl, what time of the year do turtles nest? Okay, so I was just about to answer that question too, but um, so the greens start nesting in May or May-ish and hawksbills can start nesting then too, but they tend to wait about a month after the greens do. Don't know why, it's kind of a quirky thing for them. Um, but so greens take, 
like two nests, two weeks between each nest, and coxwells take around three weeks per nest. And so they lay different amounts of nests during the season. Um, so long story short, we can have nests um, through December hatching. So it's full, you know, May through December situation that we're really worried about these turtles for the most part. Cool, thank you. Um, we did get another question about submitting writ written testimony. I'm gonna drop that information into the chat feature for everybody. It's the sa same information that Council Member King shared. Um, so I will be adding that. Um, we had another question. Um, I live in Kaanapali Plantation, AOUO. How would the ordinance affect our property? Is that, uh, I'm not sure where that is. Is that along the ocean? I am not sure. If it's considered a residential property, if it's a if it's considered a short-term rental, then it would not be exempt. But if it's considered residential units and it's not along the ocean, then you would be exempt. If you're along the ocean and you're residential, you would um, you would not be exempt from May through December. All right. Thank you. Um... Okay, I'm just going to answer this question about where can we send written testimony tomorrow. I'm just going to drop this information as an answer there. So if you have any more questions about that, please let me know. Um, and those are all the questions that we had. Um, if anyone else does have a question, we have a couple more minutes. So feel free to drop it in the Q&A. And can I share something, Chase? If you go yeah. on the um, MauiCounty.us and you look for the County Council meeting, um, or you could go back to the previous care committee meeting and you look up uh, the um, materials, the meeting, meeting materials that are attached to that item, you can click on that. There is a, a short video um, that was given to us by Hawaii Wildlife Fund that shows um, the problems with the turtle uh, hatchlings disorienting, but it also goes through the uh, ordinance in Florida, and they've talked to residents who live along the beach who have changed out the lighting. So you can see the difference in the lighting and what it does, what it looks like after the appropriate lighting has been installed. And you will also see testimony from those same folks who have lowered their their electric bill, um, you know, on a monthly basis by hundreds of dollars. So people are are not only um, saving the, the wildlife, the birds and turtles, but they're also saving on their electric bill. And people have been really, the residents there who have been complying with the laws in Florida, which are actually zero blue light, 0% 0 blue light. So all of their, um, there's, a, there's a link to this, in this bill too, that goes to uh, the Florida list of compliant lighting. And all of those would qualify for Hawaii because there's 0% blue light. Okay, awesome, thank you. Um, and then we had two questions about volunteering. How can volunteers get involved with the turtles and bird preservation? Um, I think that you had shared the link for that, Cheryl, or the, the website. Yeah, I'll, I'll put a few links in for you. Okay, we need, thank you. Definitely need volunteers, though, so thank you. And maybe you folks could talk about what volunteer activity consists of, because in my mind for the turtles, it's you know, getting up at five or six in the morning and walking along the beach looking for hatchlings. I know I've had friends who have done that, which actually sounds very attractive to me because I'm usually up at 5 a.m. anyway. So. <laughs> yeah, we we're looking for those early birds that want to um, get a little exercise first thing in the morning. So yes, like looking for hatchling, looking for adult nesting turtle tracks, which are easier to see um, depending on the beach. But yeah, definitely looking for a whole cadre of folks to do that now. Um, and then once the nests start hatching, we organize through Hawaii Wildlife Fund um, campouts at the nests. So, you know, we don't want to be any, you know, causing any disruption to the hatchlings. We want to make it as natural as possible, of course. But we found that if we're not there to watch over these hatchlings, kind of holding their flippers practically all the way to the ocean, which we don't do, but um, in spiritual form, um, that's really important because the crabs get them, the lights disorient them, people walk on them, um, it's, it's, they get stuck in vegetation and it's it's like a whole gauntlet that they have to walk. So 
especially since these hawksbills are critically endangered, we need all the help we can get to really boost these populations because even losing one hatchling could affect the population. So yeah, just sign up. Um, we have all kinds of, you know, training is involved, not, nothing super strenuous, but if you like to go to the beach and hang out and like to help hatchlings and adult turtles, that's, you're, you're hired, <laughs> essentially. But there's many other things you do, um, fixing the fence, cleaning the beaches, cleaning the reefs, like, you know, there's never a dull moment as far as that's concerned. But we need, we need more people. So, yeah. And to volunteer with the seabird work, you can go to our website, Maui Nui Seabird Recovery Project, and you, there's a space there that you can sign up, let us know that you're interested, the kinds of activities that we do are largely around habitat work. Um, a lot of weeding of invasive weeds out of colonies, and then at the appropriate times of year, planting out native vegetation, the coastal strand uh, plant community that really works with the dune structure to keep it in place. And this will all be moving as sea level rise keeps happening. So it's a very active um, habitat work that really benefits the birds if we can do it. We do have a few opportunities for actually working with the birds. In the spring, we, at night, we capture adults and read their bands. We, we're doing a long-term study of where the birds hatch and then where they go after they come back. So trying to really quantify what, how many birds do we have here? Where are they living? In the fall, in October, we ban chicks in the burrows. Out of the, we take them out of their burrows and ban them, uh, and that's a during the day activity. And we do try to include as many volunteers with that as we can. Hmm. Awesome. Cool. Well, uh, looks like we're a little past time. Uh, thank you all again for organizing this and helping us get the word out about the bill. Uh, we're happy that. Maui New Marine Resource Council could help as well. Um, and we're excited to see what happens. Thank you so much again, Chase. And thank you, Cheryl. No relation, Cheryl. I always have to, you always ask me that if we're related. And Jay, you know, I just really value um, what you've brought to the table. It's very important that we support the folks who are here who are telling us the science. And this is one of the battles that we have on the council, of course, is other folks hearing uh, a negative, um, uh, interpretation of some of the same studies that you've shown us today. So um, we, we, it's important to get the correct interpretation and from the people who are, are boots on the ground working on these issues. Yeah, and thank you, Kelly, for your leadership in this issue. It's really critical. You have a great staff that are working a, to draft this bill. And, and I really think that we're on a positive track coming out of the committee with a unanimous vote. Um, I hope that it e passes easily. I hope so too, knock on wood. <laughs> All right, well, mahalo again, everyone. And um, thank you, yeah. All right, aloha. Aloha. aloha.